Welcome to another edition of Politics Done Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Today, we are honored to have a very special guest. Actually, it's dear to my heart because of similarities in going through something that we've spoken about, about Panama. Today, we have Fatima Gilliam. She's an author, lawyer, consultant, public speaker, and entrepreneur whose career combines expertise in the law, diversity, human capital, leadership, stakeholder engagement, and negotiations. That was a long one. She holds a law degree from Columbia Law, a master's in public policy from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government, and an undergraduate degree from Wesley Scott. I always say that wrong, but it's Wellesley College. Anyway, well, welcome to Politics Done Right. Fatima, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Well, uh, before I get started, I just want to introduce that you are the author of a book that when I told Anise that I was interviewing you, she said, really? I love that. Race rules. What's your black friend won't tell you. Before we get started into what I really want to talk to you about, tell me a little bit about that book and why you wrote that book. Well, I wrote that book. I started writing it five years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. And I started, uh, I was watching the news one day and it was another story of a Karen going viral for calling the police for no reason. And as I was listening to that story, I started thinking about my lived experiences not just as a diversity consultant, but as a black woman, especially a black woman that sometimes people don't realize is black and therefore say all kinds of ridiculous things around me. And as I was watching that news story, I started thinking, you know, white people need a manual and I'll write that manual. And so Race Rules, which your black friend won't tell you, is a guide for a predominantly white audience to help them minimize the outward expression of their prejudicial beliefs so that we, people of color, can endure less toxicity and racism from them. Well, you know, I, I, when, when, I, I guess that's the reason she was so excited to hear about it. like, wow, that, that is actually very powerful. Now, you lived a uh, part of your childhood in, on a little island called Grenada. Tell me, Grenada, tell me a little bit about that. Well, so I'm originally from California and I moved as a small child for a year. I lived in Grenada with my mother and my three sisters. My mother was a documentarian and she produced documentaries that you would hear on NPR and Pacifica Radio. And she was producing a series of radio documentaries on the Caribbean and she chose Grenada as the island that we would move to. So I lived there for a year and had a fabulous time. I love Grenada. Um, and then they had a coup. And the prime minister was assassinated. And then being Americans, after the U.S. military uh, invaded the island, we were evacuated by the military. As a child, how, what, did that, what did you think was happening? Because you were pretty young when that occurred. So before we go into the technicalities of what U.S. policy does, tell me a little bit about what you thought about that event when it was happening. Well, it was interesting. I was like physically there when Maurice Bishop, the prime minister, was freed from house arrest. So there had been a coup and then he was placed under house arrest by the military. And uh, the day that he was freed from, um, uh, you know, being under house arrest, which was October 19th, 1983, there was a big demonstration and thousands and thousands of people went. And so my sisters and I were on our way to school, but there were all of these people going to this demonstration. And so we joined in. And so we went to his house where people were protesting, saying, free our leader, free our leader. And, um, you know, the, the military shot. Yeah, I don't know if they were bullets or or blanks, uh, but eventually he was freed. Um, and uh, and we were, you know, there for when it happened. But then he was assassinated. I think as it turns out, it wasn't immediate. I think they took him to the headquarters and then certain things happened. Right. He was, you know, freed from house arrest. He was supposed to go to the, you know, down in the marketplace and he was supposed to give a speech to the people because even though he was under house arrest, he still had a lot of support from the people um, because he had been the prime minister for four years. Prior to that, they had more of a dictator um, and, you know, and he brought economic prosperity, literacy, health care, those kinds of things. So he was popular. So he was supposed to go to the marketplace to give a talk when he was free, but instead he was taken to the fort. And at the fort, he was assassinated along with, you know, seven other people that were in his cabinet. 
Yeah, they call it an execution where the, the few ministers got killed. Now, <clears throat> let, let's go into the uh, to into the why. When he came into power, he came into power how? He himself, you know, took power through force. Um, you know, I don't remember all the detail. I mean, I was mm-hmm. like. That was before. I know you're a kid then. Yeah, I was. I mean, <clears throat> like an infant. I don't know when he might have taken power, but um, no, because he took power, I guess, in 1979. But sorry, <clears throat> something's in my throat. But so he um, he overthrew the previous uh, political power and then took and had a revolution. And he was also aligned with with Cuba and Castro and his you know political ideology was definitely towards socialism. And so he seized power and then implemented and instituted his own government. You know, wh- what is interesting is that that, I think, is always the cusp of uh, the problem. Whoever you sit with, it's the same thing that occurred with Hugo Chavez. It's the same thing that occurred with Manuel Antonio Noriega and, and these others. Uh, uh, Many of the countries like America or other Western countries, they generally have a problem if you are allied with anyone else or anybody that has that big S in there. But as you said, during the time of Maurice Bishop, there was a lot going on in the country. There's a lot that there's a lot of economic activity that came to fruition. You want to talk a little bit about some of what you saw there, what your mother saw as she was documenting that little island? Well, I can't say so much that I saw like as a little kid that was going to school. But what I do know that happened, like as an adult, understanding what happened is he expanded literacy. He gave free access to health care and dental care. He uh, advocated uh, equal pay for women. He implemented paid maternity leave for women. So he was implementing a lot of social policies to bring the government and the people of Grenada towards improved economic prosperity. I mean, it's a small Caribbean island, very impoverished, and he was trying to tackle that, including building an airport, which... Tell us a little bit about that. That was actually (laughs) one of the main things that the United States also used to get involved when they said, look at who he has built in the airport. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? So in terms of the airport, I mean... Was was Maurice Bishop and the Grenadian government accepting help from the Cuban government to build the airport? Yes, they were. They, they had, uh, you know, workers, construction workers that came to help them build the the uh, airport. However, they needed a new airport. I mean, the airport that they had before was just a really dinky short runway that couldn't land more than, you know, small little prop planes. They didn't have a long enough runway to expand tourism and to have big, you know, traditional airplanes come and land. And so they wanted to position themselves to be a place to increase tourism because that's how a lot of Caribbean countries, you know, expand Mm -hmm. and grow and expand their GDP. But to do that, he wanted to meet the standards of what was required and have a long enough runway that's legally required for large, you know, planes to to land. And so that's what he was working on. Now the US government said that this was going to be some military base and uh you know, I, I think that's somewhat dubious. I mean, yes, did he have ties with with Castro and Cuba? Yes, he did. Um but the people of Grenada also really love the United States and they, they were very good to Americans and they were very good to us. And there were American medical students living there and thriving there. So uh, I think it was, you know, taking the help that the country could get because the United States wasn't helping them and being able to position themselves to grow over time. That is an interesting thing. So often the United States forget <laughs> about uh, what's going on in, in its own backyard in the Western Hemisphere in the Caribbean. And when others move in, like right now, we are so preoccupied with uh, with the Middle East. We're so preoccupied with Europe and Ukraine that we forget that uh, countries see Panama, they see Jamaica, they see Honduras and all these places. And you have China really starting to take dominion, not dominion, but come into these into these areas and provide assistance that these guys would have normally preferred to have gotten from the United States of America. I think your experience in, in Grenada says quite a bit in that there it is. Uh, they fell on, they, they fell behind the curve. Uh, Castro comes in and is providing some help and now they don't want it. So they use some sort of an excuse, including some of the, some of the university students as the reason why they need to be 
needed to be militarily engaged. Now, I know it was very frightening for your entire family as you attempted to leave the island under, you know, un, under a United States invasion. What was it like, first of all, when the United States came in after the coup? Because there were two things. There was the coup. And then there's the United States coming in with its big, massive set of equipment. What was that like? Well, so first there was, right, there was the coup, you know, the assassination assassination of Maurice Bishop. But then there was also an island-wide house arrest, Mm -hmm. right, while the coup was taking place. And so if you were outside, you would be shot. But I I don't think that was going to happen to any of the American medical students. And then there was the invasion. Now... Obviously, there was a lot of political turmoil happening. There's a coup, right? There's an assassination. But I didn't really feel that we were in danger until we became the aggressor. As soon as the United States started dropping bombs and showing up with military might, then we became the aggressor and hostile within the, you know, amongst the Grenadian people. And so I feel that the United States government placed me in harm's way, but the Grenadian people and their government did not place me in harm's way. In addition to the fact that, you know, for me going through this experience, living through an invasion, not being excited about an invasion taking place on my birthday as a child, right? Then my mother having to negotiate and force the military there to actually take us. Like they, it wasn't like it seemed like they cared to actually remove us until my mom, you know, uh, was more forceful about it. And we were evacuated and I lived through that experience. Overall, the experience for me was a political awakening. You know, as a young child, I have a lot of love for Grenada. I have fond memories of living in Grenada, but it was interesting to come back and watch television and turn on TV and see politicians lying about what happened there, what was taking place there, and whether or not we were in danger there. And so for me as a young kid, as I saw this, I thought, oh, you can't believe what politicians always say. You can't believe what you see through television. You can't always have faith and trust in what your elected officials say And so that was an awakening for me. I've been very political from a very young age. I care very much about policy and and things like race and racism, which is why I wrote my book, Race Rules, What Your Black Friend Won't Tell You. And these things are important to me. Um, And a lot of it has to do with seeing that we have to hold uh, people accountable for the choices that they make and our governments accountable for the choices that they make on our behalf. One of the reasons I want you on with this story is because we're hearing a lot of stories about what's actually going on in Israel versus Hamas versus Palestine, as I mean, in Gaza. Uh, likewise, what's occurring in Ukraine and Russia, we never really know uh, the, the real truth of what's going on. Right now, we have a blackout in Gaza where all the Internet is down, which means we don't have a clue uh, who's telling the truth of what's happening. But what we know is that from satellite photos, we have a decimated uh, Gaza. This experience is the same type of experience that you had in 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 uh, in Granada is what we had in Panama when our uh, when Panama was invaded in 1989, six years subsequent to what you saw. And as opposed to just a few Grenadians getting killed, uh, according to the UN, I think it was about 4,000 or so Panamanians were killed to get Manuela. But in reality, but in reality, what was actually is we lost about 10,000 Panamanians back in those days. So, I mean, your experience, the lies that you saw on TV, the lies that we're hearing out of Israel, Gaza and 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 uh, and the and Hamas, the lies that we're hearing outside of, of Ukraine. What are the American people to do other than attempt to be, go, do things via independent media? What are they to do? Well, I'm somebody that consumes a lot of media, and I try to diversify where I'm hearing my news to try to get a more balanced understanding of what's happening. So I'm not just going to turn on the news and see what NBC has to say. I'm also going to listen to see what Democracy Now! has to say and the BBC and France 24 and a whole broad range of non-American news outlets as well, so that I can also understand the perspective of how the United States is being perceived. But generally, you know, there's the news issue, but in terms of, you know, what's happening globally, I've never been a proponent of excessive militarization of the United States and for us to show up with our might everywhere that we go. I, I want people to stay alive, 
I especially don't want civilians to be harmed. And I don't like innocent people to be put in harm's way. Just as I felt that the government, my own government, put me and my sisters and my family in harm's way when they decided to invade Grenada, which I think was a strategic play by Ronald Reagan because he was down in the polls. It's interesting because that's the same thing that one can say about the invasion of Panama. It, uh, you know, uh, so many people dead. Uh, why one would have to bomb Panama? Why one would have to bomb Grenada? Uh, it it behooves me. Neither one of the countries have an air force or a navy. It behooves me why they would have to do that. Well, you know, tell us a little bit about your book again, because I think it's an important book, especially because of what you said. You are able to hear things that many others don't hear. So you can actually sit behind the curtain. Tell us a little bit about it again. So my book, Race Rules, What Your Black Friend Won't Tell You, is different from other books out there on race. And this is how they're different. A lot of books are autobiographical, right? They talk about themselves. Now, I do show up in the book, in the beginning of the book, But then I've developed all of these rules, which are do's and don'ts to help impact behavior and decisions and choices. And so a lot of books out there talk about what racism is, how it's problematic in society. But then I feel a lot of them leave people hanging on what to actually do. Right. And so I'm in the advice game. I I do that professionally, not just as a consultant, as a lawyer. But this book is really focused on not just the sort of hearts and minds transformation for people, but action that they can actually engage in that's going to have impact on people's lives. A lot of times white people will interact with a person of color and they'll walk away thinking that they had a perfectly okay encounter. Or if there was something that didn't go well, there was just simple misunderstanding. Whereas people of color can walk away from that and say, that was totally racist, or I can't stand that person, or I can't believe that I have to deal with them at the next meeting or barbecue or family picnic or whatever happens. And so what I'm doing through race rules, what your black friend won't tell you is shine a light on these are the messed up things that, you know, white people do and how to not do them. You know, so I have, for example, translation charts, you know, it's sort of like you said this, we heard this, please say this instead. You know, so I try to break things down. It's written in a way where it's a sort of choose your own race knowledge adventure. If somebody wants to understand cultural appropriation, they can hop to that chapter. Colorblindness or voting rights or uh, how to define what racism is or tokenism. I have chapters for that. I'm trying to meet people where they are because I think, you know, the reality is, uh, you know, it's an uncomfortable subject. And I want I wanted to create a tool in this manual, this guidebook, so that people can pick and choose the information that they need in real time to make better choices and decisions that impact people of color. Fatima Gillian, it's been my pleasure to have you on Politics Done Right. Thank you so kindly for having been here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. With us today is Dr. Andy Bart Schmuckler, PhD, a prize winning author from the uh, former Democratic candidate for Congress in Virginia's very red Shenandoah Valley, former talk radio host, summa cum laude graduate of Harvard University, PhD awarded with distinction in a program specially created to accommodate his original theory explaining how civilization has developed and a frequent columnist in newspapers around the United States of America. Dr. Schmuckler, how are you doing today? Doing fine. Nice to be with you again. Great. Uh, in continuation with A Better Human Story, which is a series Politics Done Right is doing with Dr. Schmuckler, who has a website already titled A Better Human Story. Today, you pretty much got a bit philosophical. It almost seemed like a sermon in the article that we're going to be discussing today, prescient, especially in these times. We want to talk about how the evolutionary perspective gives us a better human story. And there, there are some items in there that I, I, I wanna, that I think I may wanna challenge, but I want you to first explain to me, how does the evolutionary perspective give us a better human story when we're talking about evolution? Well, I, I think it's important to recognize what a huge set of implications there are. If you have people who for, thousands of years, were trying to understand the world as they saw it, and they had no idea 
how that world had come into being. They were just looking around and they they had no idea how far back time went. And so they came up with theories that were like 5,000 years and special creations and uh, the emergence of, uh, uh, of civilization uh, uh, like in a matter of generations or something like that. They, they had no idea what science has shown, which is very different, that for three and a half billion years, life was engaged in an evolutionary process that created us and that involves certain kinds of, uh, of order that our species stepped out of very recently, you know, like 10 or 12,000 years ago, our species took a step that was completely unprecedented in the history of life. It was a step of, on the path of civilization, which I define as those societies created by a creature that has extricated itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically by inventing its own way of life. It's breaking out of an order that had taken billions of years to create. And that has implications, but they were not visible to the people who handed down religions with ideas like original sin. What I say the evolutionary perspective shows is that they stepped out of order into disorder, inevitably. Civilization inevitably emerges into dis disorder with us or any other species on any other planet. That's the way it's going to be. And that disorder has a dynamic built into it. It's going to be a war of all against all. It's going to mean only those who can prevail in a war of all against all can survive. So the system's dynamic, not human nature. Now, let me... Let, I want determines I wanna, the way the civilization evolves. I want to back up a second because um, in, in, when I read the paper, in, in the, the, there's a gist that I followed, and that is we broke out to create civilization. Uh, that is how it seemed like you're saying, and that there was something superior to the civilization as we, as human, the humans within this planet see it, right? And I sat down and I thank, and I wanted to play devil's advocates for a while. And, and this is a little bit off, off but is an, is an ant colony a civilization? Is a herd that has a systemic way of existing a civilization? Are, people, are these, these entities that lives in the live in the wild never needing particular shelter you know we 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 see civilizations as being somehow superior to all these other forms let, of organization let me break in about you because you, you let's, let's stick with the ant colony right if we define civilization i've been working on this for more than half a century this is what i think is the best definition of civilization those societies created by a creature that has extricated itself from the niche in which it evolved biologically by inventing its own way of life. In other words, a way of life, a structure of, civil, of, its, of the society uh, that was not passed down through biological selection, but was invented out of the creative intelligence of the creature. That is not the ant colony. They have not extricated themselves from the niche in which they evolved biologically. That is the niche in which they evolved biologically. But when we go from like being like primate bands, like we have been until 10 or 12,000 years ago, into inventing things which can grow without any particular limit, in, in which uh, people are controlling nature instead of gathering what's spontaneously provided by nature. It breaks all the old rules about size and structure and means of subsistence. It can go in almost any direction. That's not happening with ants or herds of caribou or something like that. What's unprecedented is that you step out of order, order created by evolution, into a new system that was not shaped by biological evolution. And that disorder is very dangerous. We didn't know we were unleashing this kind of anarchy, but that was inevitably what would happen. And so- Well, I mean, that, that occurs because again, we're, we're doing it outside the realms of what's needed. Let's give an example. 
uh, was it logical for us to move uh, uh, from us to leave the equator and move into colder areas? Well, that came with some dangers. And when those dangers apl applied, we had to use a certain kind of clothes, right, to protect ourselves, unlike those who were predisposed to live in these areas. So, I mean, from, a, from, from that point of view, it seems like a lot of the chaos that civilizations create, uh, I mean, it, it's constantly solving for the chaos it creates. True? Wait, 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 wait. You know, human beings spread throughout the whole planet before, right. before civilization. I mean, Australia and, and the New World eventually. So, and, and they were living in ways that were cultural. But they were pretty much continuous for the, uh, with the primate past out of which we had emerged. So they hadn't really, even though we had fire, which was a big deal, and we had language and we had weapons and tools, basically in terms of size and structure and how they fed themselves, they were pretty much a continuation of going back even before we were human. So let me, I need to interrupt you here because I I, I want to I want to get wh where do you then say civilization start? Because what I what I see in your statement and tell me if I'm wrong is a judgment as to what qualifies a civilization. My way, which is doing X Y Z versus the guys who it's got to do with here. whether it is the creatures creative intelligence that's designing this life every other up until we started doing something like uh you know the domestic uh, the, the rise of agriculture or something like that no species had ever done anything like that they had never you know invented out of their creative imagination a whole new way that hadn't even got been been uh uh, vetted by the process of natural selection. So you ask, where does it begin? Well, it begins when hunter-gatherers started domesticating the animals they used to hunt. And they started planting and harvesting the plants they used to gather. That's that's probably the, 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 the switch that made it possible. They got a degree of control over um, nature that allowed them to grow in population with the imperatives that that creates. And, and it be makes, becomes possible to uh, harvest, um, uh, to deal with, with over ever more power over nature by creating these new kinds of organization that were not the product of natural selection, but were, you know, how chiefdoms became kingdoms, became empires. This is a this is something which is a different kind of, of it's a social evolutionary process that grows out of anarchy. And it is discontinuous with three and a half billion years that went before it. And the evolutionary perspective tells us. That was a big deal when we took that step, that unprecedented step. It has major implications. And even though it's been more than a century and a half now since Darwin put out the idea that we didn't emerge five, six thousand years ago in, in the Garden of Eden, we emerged out of a very long process in which things get shaped in life-serving ways because that's what survives. And that breaking out of that had implications that nobody could have anticipated. It's not like it's our fault. We're the victims of being the first creatures on this planet that had the, the means to invent a, a whole different new way of life. You know, the chimpanzees uh, have the uh, sticks they use to get the termites, and they, you know, we're not the only ones that got tools. And there may be languages of, of a primitive sort that are out there among prairie voles or uh, elephants or whatever. But we took it so far that we could transform the way we lived. People invented whole different ways of living. And then they were thrown into an anarchy where different societies, each one representing a different cultural approach, but different societies are, are, are engaged in a world in which, unlike the world out of which they emerged, the interactions among things are governed by nothing. They're governed by no natural order, and it's 
fragmented and there's no human order. They're basically engaged in what Hobbes called the war of all against all, which is the result inevitably of anarchy. And out of that, there is a process of selection, only certain kinds of society. You like my phrase, the spirit of the gangster. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So that especially... comes in right here. That, that the, the evolutionary perspective shows that when you take that step onto the path of civilization, it is inevitable that the spirit of the, of the gangster will play a disproportionate role in shaping that creature's civilization. I want to read a piece uh, from your article. You said any creature, because believe it or not, my brother, I think this particular a uh, statement is presumptuous. Check this out. Oh, okay. Any creature, any creature on any, any planet, anywhere in the cosmos that takes the step onto the path to civilization will inevitably get swept up, regardless of that creature's nature, into the same social evolutionary process that has made the course of human civilization as destructive and tormented as ugly at, as it has been, the ugliness we see in human his and and then you says which tells you that the ugliness it, we see in human history is not human nature writ large. Okay, you think well, those are I me, think I can prove it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. To me, those are conflicting statements. But go ahead and no, no. See, I say any creature on any mm -hmm. planet is going to get into the same kind of a mess. And, and the reason is, wherever civilization may have emerged, and we, we don't know, you know whether we're right. unique or we're one of billions or whatever, but they will have evolved, their life will have evolved on this planet and will have created this creature that has the capacity to invent its own way of life, which it will then do, and it will inevitably emerge into that anarchy. Question. Because because that's what it means when you start inventing your way of life and you've got a diversity of cult of, of civilized societies that have to interact with each other. And there is nothing to regulate that interaction, nothing, nothing that has evolved biologically and nothing that the creature has, has invented to keep it from being the spirit of gangster, the gangster that takes over how its history unfolds. And then, and, and that's why I said, and that's why I said in conflict, because I, I think I, I, I think I was with you. I agreed with the entire paragraph. And then I, then the conclusion was, which tells you that the ugliness we see in human history. That is follows. Not human. It's not a contradiction. It follows logically. If there are systemic forces that inevitably mean that for the first whatever uh, of a creature's civilization on any planet, it's going to unfold like what we see like this. It'll be full of empires and tyranny and enslavement and tortures and and uh, uh, the inculcation of uh, of cultural norms and moralities that are at war with you with the creature's nature. It's inevitable, is what I. That's inevitably going to be the case, and that means that it is going to be an ugly history regardless of the creature's nature. So I say the ugliness we see in human history is not human nature at large, meaning it is instead what is made inevitable by a social evolutionary process that inevitably emerges out of the anarchy that civilization inevitably plunges into. I, I think I think the difference in the in the way uh, we, we think about this is that um, you know, uh, let, let me give an example with, let's say, gays. OK, I uh, I learned that I was wrong in, in the way I thought about gays. And then not only that, but then if you if for those who believe in a supreme being, a creator or, or whatever, and if they believe that the creator created human beings and within human beings, people have different attributes, et cetera, then you don't you, you have to say that. Uh, you know, if 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 gayness was a mistake, I'm just using this as an example. Then that is of God, right? It's not it's not the, the the gay person. So I mean, when I look at when I look at your statement here, that is how I am I am qualifying it. I'm saying, wait a minute, then if if humans created all this anarchy, right, and the, by having the creation of this anarchy, we get some sort of the ugliness that 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 comes about. Even if you want to say that that's not human nature, it was created by humans, which, oh, in my yeah. opinion, 
mistakes yeah, in human see, nature. See, see, you know, I wrote the book, The Parable of the Tribes, which yeah, correct, which which was the book. Which, a lot of pages, man. A lot of pages. Well, <laughs> it, you know, it, it won a prize, and you know, it, 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 it's it's the the idea that I'm presenting here, essentially, which took over my life starting in 1970, got me my doctorate, you know. A whole bunch of yeah. stories, but the, the way you got to say it's not human nature. First of all, let me first tell you that I agree <laughs> with you. Let, let me finish. Let me finish. I agree with you that it's not human nature. But <laughs> I, the reason I, I said earlier about the, the statement being presumptuous is that it, the statement that preceded that uh, made it seem to be that after all, it is human nature. That's no, that's all. I see, see, in that statement, be preceded it. There was the phrase which you read, regardless yes. of the nature of that creature. Yes. So yes. yeah, see, you can. We think that uh, we're to understand what goes on in the world in terms of uh, what we see the people doing. You know, like mm -hmm. Nazis at Auschwitz or something like that. Yeah. But if you see that, it is inevitable when a creature takes that crucial step onto the path of civilization, they will unleash a force of such brokenness, something which is, um, it, it ramifies through the system. And that's a, a, another thing that you can sort of derive from this, that, that a, a coherent force emerges in the system that drives things in a particular direction. And so people are acting but it is the system that determines how the system develops. I mean, I have a line that I've uh, that was a big deal to me in the 1970s and the 1980s. That which determines the chooser determines the choice. Excellent. And the, Excellent. the tyrant, the, uh, a Putin or Hitler or Trump type figure that has this inordinate impact on the course of, of, of human history, monsters are way overrepresented on the pages of history. Exactly. And, and, so, and it, we look at it and we say, these damn human beings, they keep throwing up monsters. But that which determines the chooser is the systemic force of brokenness that uh, is molding things over time in ways that make the spirit of the gangster a dominant force in the world. I think that's one of the most important statements here, because, I mean, I, I, as simplistic as I'm going to say here, where I preach all of the times that most people are good, unfortunately, most people's votes are ill-conceived, which gives us not good leaders. I, mean, I know you've heard of the benevolent dictator or the, 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 the person who has omnipotent power and never uses it for harm, but just for good. I, I agree with the statement. The ugliness we see in human history is not human nature writ large. Unfortunately, however, uh, we are responsible for, based mostly on our ignorance and gullibility, to have brought those people well, forward. I think we should, uh, you know, we're responsible, yeah. Uh, but I think we should have compassion uh, for our country. I agree. Uh, we, we took a step that was a manifestation of our unprecedented gifts. Uh, other animals, have, no other animal has been able to take that step. So we should have compassion for the fact that we stumbled into something that we couldn't have anticipated. It wouldn't be reasonable to think that the people who first started uh, planting gardens next to their huts and creating pens in which uh, goats or uh, or sheep or whatever were were penned. Well, it, it's not reasonable to have imagined that they they were in any position to anticipate that they had put us on an incline that was going to lead to the, the ugly tyrannies that came five thousand years later. It was inevitable going to inevitably going to unfold in some such way, and we should have compassion for ourselves, even as we hold ourselves responsible for trying to put it together before we destroy ourselves. Now let's let let's move on from there because I think that can lead us. Give, given that you're talking about the compassion portion now, can lead yeah, us okay. into 
can lead us in, in, into uh, what we call the spiritual dimension. Okay. Oh, wow. so we talked about the non -evolu the, the, the part of evolution, the, the non evolutionary portion of civilization yeah. being causal for what we're done. Now, where, what's the spiritual perspective? Yeah. So, so the evolutionary perspective, I put forward two principles. We, we've discussed the first principle, which is how and evolution. We dabbled into the second as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the second one, the second principle is that. For the most part, whatever we see, it has has been crafted into the inherent nature of a creature. Is the fact that it's there means that it must have been life serving, because otherwise evolution wouldn't have favored the ones that had that kind of a uh, characteristic. Now, an important dimension of the characteristics that are inherent to our nature are embedded in the experiential realm. That the, the, the secular, the first idea I have says, let's get rid of original sin. It's not human nature. The second one says the secular worldview has this stupid idea that the moral and spiritual dimensions are less than real and need to be given less than complete honor, because they're merely subjective. They are not merely subjective. The, 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 the evolutionary perspective says that we have tendencies to experience certain things because they helped our ancestors to survive. And one of the dimensions in which people who and, and we don't, this is not just human beings, everybody with a cat or a dog will recognize this. We experience things in terms of better and worse. We feel fulfillment and we feel misery. We feel pleasure, we feel pain. It's built into us and it's built into us for a very good reason. In order to survive, a creature has to do what survival requires. And life has chosen as one of the key strategies to make sure of that is to create an experiential dimension between the better and the worse. The, the things that feel better, we, we pursue. And they feel better because of the ancestors who experienced them positively help, were, were more likely to survive, to pass their DNA along in our direction uh, than the ones who didn't feel that way. So we get shaped, uh, you know, I don't know whether it starts and whether you talk about one-celled creatures, but certainly long before you get to us, the, the better and the worse and the, the experience of things being better and things being worse is, is part of life strategy for for uh, unfolding and and, and enduring. Tied into the spiritual form, it tied into the spiritual because okay. we're the spirit. Okay, the, the the value thing we got in common with lots of other creatures. It may be that the spiritual is unique to to human beings, but I, mean, I don't know. You know what elephants do and what uh, gorillas do in the spiritual dimension. I don't know, but I do know that a substantial portion of uh, of the human population across cultures and throughout history have experiences they describe as being somehow like a, of a special dimension. Uh, which we often refer to as spiritual, but you know whatever the words might be, but they they're characterized by a, an unusual feeling of depth of breaking through to another level, and 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 one comes back from those experiences with uh, things that one regard regard as important spiritual truths, and they can be motivating uh, of such impact on the people who experience them. That's very often. The whole course of a life is impacted and, and goes in a different direction. So it seems to be a real part of human nature, or whether how universal it is, I don't know. But you know, not everybody responds to music. Is it real? It is real because it is a part of our human nature, and it and it impresses upon us certain things with an especial sense of their essential reality. The the truths that the, the reality that people see in those experiences feels more real, and so we have to ask ourselves: Well, what is it accounts for that being? 
you know, part of human experience. Well, and well, I mean, actually, it seems to me like you, you already you, the conclusion of your paper gives the answer with one sentence, even though you kind of explain it thereafter. When you say filling important holes in the contemporary secular worldview, that's if, what I looked at. If, it. if the spiritual dimension it can be recognized that the evolutionary perspective shows as having been life serving you know, throughout the development of who we are. And I, I have some thoughts about why it might be particularly humans who have these experiences. Then we can infer that it's been life-serving. And I think it can be plausibly argued that if we look at what people come back from uh, that spiritual dimension with, they do look life-serving. And they... And that is, and as we head into the future where we really might destroy ourselves, we should honor that dimension, which has been giving human beings showing paths that lead to survival. And it can do that for us too, but not if we denigrate it, like the secular worldview, which says, oh, that's just, you know, that's merely subjective or something. No, there may be important subjective elements. Not everybody comes sees the same thing. To come. But the thing that's in there is not subjective. It is a, a, a manifestation of what it takes for human beings to survive. So we should listen to that voice. It is likely to tell us things about, you know, and I use the example of the spiritually transformative experiences of American astronauts. The, when the first people went out there and saw this blue marble, you know, the first human beings to see it, some people had their lives changed by spiritual experience. I think that there's and there's something mysterious about this, but I think the evidence suggests that people come back from that dimension with very important messages that can help guide us to creating the kind of civilization we need to to avoid blowing ourselves up or de so completely destroying this uh, the biosphere that that our lives uh, fall apart to. So, Doctor. Uh, in conclusion, how the evolutionary perspective gives, tell me in, in, a, in a few sentences, then summarize, how does the evolutionary perspective give us a better human story? Well, it's, it, our, our job is to get our act together before we destroy ourselves. Better human story, first of all, tells us we are better creatures than we thought, thought we would be. And I think we could imagine how if we had an image of ourselves as as inherently better, that would fortify us. I think we live down to our expectations. So I think it's better that way. And then the other thing is I'm just alluding it to it. I think if we take the, the the issue of good and evil more seriously, and that we didn't get much into that. And I think if we take we met, we look look to the spiritual dimension for guidance more than we do with our contemporary wor uh, secular worldview. Get rid of original sin, bring in real honor to the spiritual dimension because we need all the guidance we can. Our ancestors survived because they got they had that spiritual guidance, whether it's shamans uh, in the Siberia or wizards in the, the Amazon. There has been a place for the spiritual dimension to guide human societies for further back in civilization. And now that we're in this mess, we really need it. And so we should fully honor it and tune in and, and make the better human story one where it, we can survive on the long, for the long haul on a healthy planet rather than destroy ourselves and take the planet down with us. Dr. Andy Bart Schmuckler, thank you once again for enlightening us under a better human story. Thank you. Thank you, Egberto. A few days ago, we discussed about APAC spending $100 million, up to $100 million to take out the squad. You know, that is Ilan Omar, uh, Jamal Bauman, uh, Ilan, uh, uh, Alida Shalid, and, and many other progressive, uh, progressive Democrats, all of them people of color. The American Israel Public Affairs Committee decided that because these folks are asking for ceasefire or asking for peace or asking uh, and, and making relative commentary that says, hey, 
Palestinians are human beings too because they have that stance. They must not. They must have 100% support for what Israel does, the Israeli government does, no matter what. If you don't do that, if you don't toe the line, then we are going to get you primaried. We are willing to spend $100 million on getting rid of you. That's a danger against democracy. Listen to this and then we'll take it on the other side. 1,400 Israelis slaughtered by Hamas, women raped, babies beheaded, over 200 hostages. But Jamal Bowman was one of just 10 votes in Congress against condemning Hamas's terrorism. Tell Jamal Bowman to stand with Israel. That was a new ad now running in the District of New York Congressman Democrat Jamal Bowman. The ad is from the political arm of the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC, as it is more commonly known. And it is not the first time that APAC has tried to take on progressive members of Congress or even take on Jamal Bowman himself. But it is the first time that APAC's mission is part of a larger battle within the Democratic Party over the Israel-Hamas war. And that fight is most evident in the debate between pro-Israel Democrats and the squad. Congressman Bowman is already facing a potential challenge from Westchester County Executive George Latimer, who says he will make a final decision after returning from a solidarity trip to Israel. Other squad members, including Cori Bush, Ilhan Omar, Summer Lee, and Rashida Tlaib, are all expected to face potential primary challengers as well. As Michelle Goldberg writes in the New York Times, A series of ugly primary campaigns fought over Israel will only widen the progressive political divide. But with horror at conditions in Gaza and Jewish fear both ratcheting up, an intra-party clash over the future of the squad now looks inevitable. Joining me now is New York Congressman Democrat Jamal Bowman. Talk to me a little bit about what this moment has been like as, as you sort of navigate a constituency really more pronounced in its division than all many other members of Congress. Yeah, it's been a traumatic moment. Um, it's been a painful moment. It's been a moment filled with grief and suffering by my Jewish constituents as well as my Muslim constituents. And so um, it's been multi-layered. You have the behavior of the Israeli government, which needs to be critiqued uh, very strongly in my belief, my belief. You have the impact of that critique on the Jewish community, both locally in my district and globally. You have Muslims who have felt uh, erased in this whole conversation and even dehumanized as well. When you hear some of the rhetoric coming from Israeli officials towards Palestinians, referring to them as animals. Uh, So it's been multi-layered, multifaceted, filled with very strong emotion. And what I've tried to do is just absorb it, sort of stand in the middle of it, Mm -hmm. learn from it. And then use what I learned to govern accordingly in a way that meets the needs of a diverse constituency, as you mentioned. I I was struck, Michelle Goldberg, who was just our guest in the previous uh, segment, uh, followed your campaign as you, uh, your, you, as you tried to navigate meetings with constituents over on this topic. And she, she quotes one, one woman who was involved, I believe, with your campaign at one point, Diana Lovett said polarization over the congressman was tearing apart local Democrats. I love him personally. He was lovely and he's amazing. And he was the same warm and open hearted person that he was today. This is at the the event that you had. But she had come to believe that their views on the Middle East are irreconcilable. When you hear that, what what is your reaction to that? Oh, thank you for saying I have a big heart. Well, she and she said that. that. No, thank you to her for saying that. Um, I don't think they're irreconcilable. I think for a very long time we've been having one conversation without the other. We have been saying for so long, we are pro-Israel, pro-Israel's right to exist, pro-Israel's right to defend itself and self-determination. But we haven't been saying the same thing about Palestinians. And so what I've been trying to communicate, and this is all, again, based on my learning, I work very closely with Americans for Peace Now, J Street, if not now, uh, Jewish Voices for Peace and many organizations. Israel's safety and security is directly connected to Palestinian freedom, safety, and security. So we've been using a lot of rhetoric around the two-state solution for decades. And when I went there, I saw that we are nowhere near a two-state solution. Myself, as a sitting member of Congress, could not walk through certain checkpoints in the West Bank because I wasn't Jewish. Mm. So 
we're, we're using rhetoric, but our policies aren't matching the rhetoric and our policies aren't matching the urgency of the moment. Um, October 7th was a horrible day, horrific day, and Hamas must be condemned and we must get the hostages, hostages back. Absolutely. But condemnation is only step one. How are we going to do the work to actually get to a state for Palestinians and do the work here to bring communities together around education and engagement so we could deal with anti-Semitism in a real way, Islamophobia in a real way, racism, sexism, and all the isms that continue to plague us in a real way. We haven't done it here, and we're not doing it globally. Now, Jamal Bowman is one of the best guys that you can think of. Very nice guy. Always respectful to everybody, votes his conscience, want to make sure everybody's at the table. And for that, APAC, because he's not a puppet, because he's not a robot that says, whatever Israel does, it's okay. We will definitely support them. Because he decides that's not who he's going to be, that he's going to believe in humanity. He's going to believe in morality. He's going to believe that uh, an Israeli child that was murdered has gone through the same pain as an um, American child or a or Palestinian child. All lives matter in this regards, folks. Every single life matters. And because he's taking that stance, because the squad is taking that stance, because they decide that this neoliberal militarism isn't the answer. After all, they've been at it for 75 years and they're just killing in between each other. Of course, because of the asymmetric warfare that we have here, uh, Israel always exact orders of magnitude, more death, destruction and pain on Palestinians than they inflict on uh, on Israel. And you know, you don't have to you don't have to create stories, you don't have to create anything. Just look at the numbers, just look at the state of destruction in city after city, Palestinian city versus Jewish city. According to everything that we see, they make you believe the one group is always the aggressor. Folks, your eyes are not lying to you. Death. There are now for the 1200 Israeli deaths that's horrendous they were it was criminal it was terroristic but now for that the toll in Gaza is 10 times more than 10 times that number where is the humanity where is the empathy where is the morality we spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.